Welcome to the show. Glad to have you with us today. IB Nation Sports Talk. We're up and rolling along with Jesse Styers. I'm Sean Styers. He's got his cup of tea working on it there, trying to cure the common cold today. Feeling a little bit better anyway. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, the last few days I've had a horrible kind of chest cold, chest cough. And then when you're coughing so hard, you start to form kind of a headache because of all the pressure um, on your head. So, yeah, I've just been a little under the weather recently, but drinking a lot of tea, drank some cough syrup last night, been using these Ricola cough drops. So, had to make sure that I that the voice sounded good for tonight's t- tonight's show. Yes, and as Salty says, we're the only show today on the Irish Breakdown channel. There was uh, no no Driscoll shows. Uh, Brian and Vince did two shows yesterday with uh, m- my show, IB Nation Sports Talk. In between and already calls for the whiteboard. Whiteboard Wednesday says Anthony. I wanted to start off, Jess, kind of giving you, you know, we're going to talk mostly about the defense today, but you know, since Anthony brings this up, I, I, you know, I've got to give you props. I I tweeted this during the game. Some of the stuff you drew up on the whiteboards in the last couple of weeks, we saw in the Gator Bowl, including... Yeah, they used uh, a lot of that motion. You saw it with Tyree on a big third down where they, they literally motioned yep. him out to the to the opposite of the three three wide receiver set, motioned him back to the backfield just to see what the coverage was looking like. And again, I, I know it's simple, but that was the main thing I was kind of harping on is for someone like Buckner, when you want to understand coverage and what's going on pre-snap, he did exactly that. They did a ton of pre-snap motion, you know, not just that play, but they were doing it a lot for exactly what you were talking about. Let Tyler Buckner see what the defense is doing. Are they zone? Are they man? You know, does a defender follow that guy in motion? And they did a lot of that, a lot of pre-snap motion and movement as well. And like one wasn't necessarily motion, but just the, the first Tyler Buckner touchdown run they had, uh, you know, Morgan. You know, they, they had like guys in the backfield and lined up tight, and then he spread everybody out. And what happened when he spread everybody out? I don't know if you remember this because we didn't talk about this. There was a there was a safety sitting back there. First, the safety creeped up to the middle of the field. Then all of a sudden, he was over to Tyler Buckner's right. Basically, the whole middle of the field opened up when he spread all the wide receivers out. And so, what did he do? Quarterback draw. He takes it in for a touchdown just so much of that stuff and like the logan diggs play that is a play that specifically you drew up where you've got the slot and in that case it was matt salerno you bring the slot from uh the you know the right slot motion into the backfield heading the other direction and then you leak logan diggs out into that vacated spot boom it ends up being a uh, 75 yard touchdown so kudos to jesse and the whiteboard for all the stuff that he drew up prior to the Gator Bowl. I'm glad some of it came to fruition because then I just hey. like a guy that's just talking for no reason. <laughs> that's right. But I, you know, again, I love the way, and it wasn't just that touchdown run. I love the way they manipulated the box at times just by, you know, maybe subtly pushing a wide receiver a little bit farther out because they had like a bunch formation a couple of times where they'd have three receivers and then they'd spread them. And again, they would see how the defense would respond and then they would take advantage of it. You know, like we we talk about Tommy Reese and the offensive. We we did see really good Tommy Reese with the exception of, you know, the one play that everybody wants to talk about, of course, you know, being the second pick six. So a lot of good stuff that we saw. But, uh, you know, again, we saw it on the whiteboard. Hey, hit that like button if you would. Here in the the YouTube channel, subscribe, rate, and review on your podcast platforms. It helps out Irish Breakdown greatly. We're over 13,000 YouTube subscribers now. I think we came up something like 2,000 subscribers over the course of the season. So keep doing it. Keep rating, reviewing, subscribing, commenting, sharing, all that great stuff. Help the Irish Breakdown channel grow and basically bring you more shows throughout 
the year. So that's what it does when you help spread the word. We appreciate it. So we, we talked a lot about Tyler Buckner and the offense. Vince and I did on yesterday's show, Jess. How about Al Golden's defense? We only really touched on it a little bit. How do you come away from this Gator Bowl feeling about Al Golden's defense? You know, I've I've been one of the, the people who, I guess, hasn't been as hard on Al Golden throughout this season as maybe some others or many others, you know, may have been. And I, I think it, it's a tribute to his first year in the system. It's a tribute to a lot of these players being the first year in, you know, Al Golden's system. And I know that a lot of defenses are similar at the end of the day. But when you're going between three different defensive coordinators in a span of three years, that's going to be hard, you know, no matter what. That can't go mm-hmm. – um, unnoticed or, or not talked about. So I thought that Al Golden's defense was a solid unit all year. And, you know, despite kind of the early struggles that they faced against South Carolina, I thought that Al Golden's defense is ultimately what ended up winning this game for Notre Dame in the second half, uh, being able to shut down North Carolina and and really just, just uh, honestly, just it dwindled on down. The offensive, uh, you know, output was, was, uh, it got lower and lower every quarter. And that's exactly what you want to do when you're trying to finish out a team. So I thought the defense made the necessary adjustments after kind of getting toasted early in the game and really shut it down and ultimately sealed the deal uh, for Notre Dame's victory. Yeah. D rock points out tackling at open space needs improvement big time. Uh, it, it, that's not a coaching flaw. We saw that throughout the season. I felt like, you know, again, there were some issues early on. It definitely got better throughout the course of the game, you know, specific to the Gator Bowl. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times you see teams take a month off and you see just horrendous tackling in bowl games. I, you know, and again, USC. there was some of that. Yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly right. USC was just atrocious. And, you know, one thing that's important, I think, to keep in mind when you look at, okay, South Carolina scored 38 points. Obviously, 17 of that, only 17 of that came from – the defense, because you had two pick sixes and, of course, the special teams touchdown. So that's 21 of the 38 points. Only 17 points came from Al Golden's defense. And you talked about the yardage for South Carolina dropped every quarter from 154 in the first quarter to 98, 68, 32. It got incrementally, you know, better for Notre Dame, worse for them. The first half total, 252 total first half yards on 45 plays, 5.6 per play. Second half, 100 yards on 28 plays, just 3.6 per play. Why do you think they were able to do so much better? What you know, Were there any specific adjustments that you saw over the course of, of the game? You know, honestly, outside of X's and O's, because you can get into, you know, formationally what they're doing and that kind of stuff. But the main thing I noticed, and I, I was tell, talking to you about this early in the game, is everyone just seemed so not 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 prepared, but it looked like South Carolina was giving them looks that they weren't really prepared for. And you saw a lot of Notre Dame guys kind of flying around pre-snap. And as there the ball was being confusion. snapped, there was definitely right. more confusion. Early so guys on. were trying to get yeah. lined up early in the first quarter. Guys were trying to figure out, you know, what the strength was uh, of the formation. It just to me, it felt like as the game went on, they became more comfortable. And the thing that you do on the defense, at least when I was playing in college, is you got a guy on the sideline with a whiteboard the entire time. I'm sure they either have that up in the press box or, you know, someone is tracking every play, what South Carolina comes out in formation, pre-snap motion, all of that stuff, what the play is, you know, pass run, da, 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 da. And so I think Notre Dame wasn't really prepared for some of those things in the beginning. And formationally, they were having a hard time lining up and when you're not formationally lined up you're going to get gashed or gouged for some plays because it just takes one guy not being in the right gap in order for the whole scheme to kind of go uh, astray so I think throughout the game and especially at halftime they really sat down and said okay we now have a better understanding of what they're trying to execute how are we going to adjust our defense and better line up and you didn't see those those issues as much in the second half like guys kind of flying around not knowing when to line up you know that kind of stuff so I felt like they became more comfortable as the game went on and they were doing a better job of recognizing what South Carolina was doing offensively. Yeah. South Carolina scored on three of its first four offensive possessions, total of 17 points on three of their first four possessions. Then after that, they punted on six of their last nine possessions, 
And then, you know, Ben Morrison has the interception in that stretch as well at the end of the first half. Six interceptions for Morrison, the first in 10 years since Man Titeo. And then when you look at the entirety of the season, Golden's defense held 11 of the 13 teams they played under what those teams averaged in scoring for the season. The only teams that scored more than their season average against the Irish. Do you have any idea who it is off the top of your head? I didn't share this note with you. Um, Here to guess. Above their season season average. I know USC scores av- must have averaged a lot of points. So that's probably the obvious answer, but I feel like it's not USC. So USC um, was just a shade under. I'm actually going to probably say like Stanford or Marshall, to be honest with you. Uh, Marshall is one of them. The other Navy, of course. <laughs> of course. Navy, you know, the second half and the one-off. It was not Stanford. Stanford actually ended up, you know, they scored, what, 16 points that day? And here, hang on just a sec. Fortunately, I left this sitting right by. Stanford scored. Stanford actually averaged 32 points a game. Wow. I don't know how, but they only scored 16 against the Irish. And, of course, they won. You know, that that game was much more on the offense than it was the defense. And, uh, yeah. So amazingly, um, yeah, USC averages 41.4 points per game. They scored 38 against Notre Dame. Navy averaged only 22 points per game. They scored 32 against the Irish. Now, Marshall, the one the one thing with Marshall is, so they scored 26. They ended up averaging 24.4 at the time. That was game three for them. That was still the lowest that Marshall had scored at that point. But of course, you know, Marshall went on, wasn't exactly <laughs> the world beater that we thought they would, but it, it's still only two teams on Notre Dame's entire schedule um, managed to score above what their season average was. You know, Golden held 11 of the, Golden in that defense held 11 of the 13 teams below their scoring average. I think the biggest thing that you look at when you look at this defense though his first defense, especially as you look at where can they improve next year, there's no doubt that the red zone scoring is the biggest area where they have to get better next year with with, with all the red zone scores that they gave up. You know, you, br- you pointed out before, teams don't get into the red zone a lot against them, but when they do get into the red zone, they typically find their way into the end zone. And that's something, especially as you look at, you're, okay, now – you can you can be nine and four this season, but as you go forward and you're looking at you know are 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 we going to be back in the championship picture, college football playoff picture, New Year six, whatever it happens to be, that's the area that has to drastically change and improve next year. Yeah, the, so you brought up. I, I kind of went through. I have a, a multitude of different stats that I'd like to kind of go through um, and that point out the kind of good and bad of Notre Dame's defense, and you hit on some of the bad, the bad already is the red zone defense efficiency. Um, another, another area I'd like to see Notre Dame improve in uh, is more turnovers generated. They picked it up on the back half of the season, but that was specifically Definitely. kind of one person, you know, Ben, Ben Morris really, I think they ended with 10 interceptions and five fumble recoveries and Morrison had 60% of those interceptions. So he yeah. he's, he's creating almost, you know, 40, 40% of those turnovers himself. So, I would love to see the defense, one, be better in the red zone, create more turnovers. And another area that I thought they were really bad at is they were they were ranked 50th in the country on third down uh, efficiency as well. I think that's another big area. That's when you're trying to get off the field um, and really what extends drives and kind of wears up down your team. So that's another area that I'd love to see Notre Dame do better in is their third down efficiency. But now on to the good stuff. You know, Notre Dame – on first down offense was 28th and and best in the country. That's pretty good. Uh, Pass yards given up. They were 23rd in the country, Um, you know, 37th and rush yards given up. You'd like to see that number a little bit better, but that's still pretty solid uh, in the grand grand scheme of things. They're 16th in total sacks. Um, I know a lot of people got on, you know, Notre Dame's defensive line coach. Uh, They were still 16th in total sacks this season. Uh, They were, Helps uh, when you've got Isaiah Foskey with the sacks he ended up with, with right. 11 plus. So that helps. And so what are you going to see output wise, you know, once, once he's gone. Um, and another, th- another impressive stat that I saw was they averaged 22 or sorry, 23 points per game on defense. That's, 
it's a pretty solid number. If you tell most colleges these days, especially, <coughs> excuse me, if you tell most you know, college offenses that you just need to score over 23 points this game, I think they would take that challenge, right? That's three touchdowns and a field goal. You average around 10, 11, 12 possessions per game. I think that's very doable. So, you know, overall, grand scheme of things, I thought Notre Dame's defense was a top 30, maybe even top 25 defense in the country, you know, with all those stats combined. So, again, a very solid output. Uh, by Al Golden's defense this this year. And specifically, there was another point I wanted to get into very quickly regarding the bowl game. You know, South Carolina scored sometime in the third quarter. It might be midway towards the end of the third quarter to go up 31 to 24, right? And in yeah. the ensuing position or possession, Buckner throws an interception and South Carolina gets the ball on Notre Dame's 41 after just scoring a touchdown. Yeah. It's a very tough spot to be in because they this help. is – they held them in a very crucial situation because I think if South Carolina scores another touchdown in that instance, this game might not end in a victory for Notre Dame because you're going up two possessions and now we're going into the fourth quarter. So I thought that was a very crucial stand. And that's, that's something that's practiced often, you know, with these, with these teams is sudden changes, right? Like an interception. And now you're suddenly on defense after you just gave up, you know, a touchdown before that. So that was a specific instance in the second half where I really felt like, you know, Al Golden, the defense, shut it down and really provided for their team. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, they again, they stepped up big in the second half. They forced punt after punt after punt. They only gave up the one touchdown in the second half, and even that one was disputed. We talked about it yesterday, you know, that it, the, the, the side of the end zone, whether or not you – know, it sure looked to a lot of us like that uh, – chalk on the outside line moved you know when they zoomed in on his foot but i agree with what some other people said it was very blurry and probably too hard to tell definitively exactly you know what happened there but the bottom line is the defense played lights out in the second half for the most part and that that stand that you're talking about really was a a, a swing stand when you look at at how the game played out to to give up the ball you know, where the other team gets the ball in plus territory and you end up holding. That was huge for the outcome of the game. Um, the secondary, I mean, you look at what's coming back in the secondary. You don't have that, you know, if you want to call Brandon Joseph a high-end safety, you don't have that. But, I mean, you look at, um, you know, they, they ended up starting – DJ and they started Xavier Watts back there at safety in that game. And Xavier Watts played a really good game. You know, that, that kind of flew under the radar a little bit. The fact that Watts was back there starting after he started off the season, like, is he even going to stay at safety? Is he going to go to wide receiver? And so now you've got, you know, basically the, the entire secondary coming back led by Cam Hart, who didn't even play in that game. Now you're going to lose Tariq Bracey, obviously, but you're going to have Hart, you're going to have Morrison, Jaden Mickey with some experience under his belt. You know, looks like he would be the potential natural fit as as the nickelback next year. So that keeps looking better and better. I mean, it's like, you know, the secondary has been something that's been a concern more times than not over the years here at Notre Dame. And now you're looking at it and it's like you can't help but be excited about this secondary coming back next season. Yeah, I think in terms of like the hierarchy of concerns on defense, one, two, and three, number one concern for me is the output at defensive line. Uh, number two is going to be what what linebacker rotation works the best. And the least of my concerns is what's going on in the secondary because they've been playing lights out with a lot of young players. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the I think the front – is you know is going to be one of the bigger questions, and a lot of people talking about Al Washington between the development as well as you know the the recruiting. But like P Dub says, bottom line, you got to get some three hundred plus pounders. You've, it's it's amazing how kind of undersized that interior of the defensive line has been. And you know, and I'm thinking about Al Washington, and I think we need to kind of give this a little bit of time before we can really judge him because one thing about Mike Elston, like you talk about the development that Mike Elston had, but he had an eye for, you know, those, those lower four and, and the three-star guys he could bring in and develop guys who are going to take a little bit of time to develop. 
but he had a specific eye for what he was looking for in those guys. And what I wonder right now was some of the pieces that are there on the defensive line. Like I, I think back to my time when I was doing the play-by-play -play with Notre Dame baseball when Paul Maneri was there. Because Paul, you know, very similarly had a specific eye for the kind of kid that he wanted to bring in. And when he would recruit these guys, he would tell them, and, you know, and, and a lot – a lot of, you know, very under the radar type guys I'm talking about, not a bunch of higher end guys, because what he would do is he would invest more of his scholarship money because the way baseball works, he would invest more of his scholarship money into the pitching. And then he would have to find diamond in the rough type players kind of along the lines of what Mike Elston would did or would do. And he would tell them, this is what I see you being when you come to Notre Dame, you know, like. Other people might not necessarily see this, but this is what I see, and this is what you can become at Notre Dame. And then when Paul Maneri left, there were some of these guys who were obviously left on the roster. A new coaching staff took over, and you know, like these kids were telling the new coaching staff, "Well, this is what Paul Maneri told me," and they were like, "I don't see that at all," you know. So I just feel like maybe, maybe. Mike Elston's specific eye for some of these things hasn't necessarily translated for Al Washington yet. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I still think a lot is still to be proven for a lot of different aspects of this defense. I know, like I said, this is Al Golan's first year. I thought he had a solid year, but you can't really judge a guy off of such a small sample size. And that's really how I feel about Al, Al Washington, too, is, you know, once we start seeing kind of his – his recruit cycle in his, you know, what he does in more years, you know, year two, year three, defensively, schematically wise, while also, you know, developing these younger players, that's when we can start drawing conclusions. And I know that's easy to say now because you don't want, because you don't want it to get too late, right? Like you don't want year three and four to be bad still. And then you've kind of wasted time and allowed it to be something that negatively impacts the overall defense. But again, I still think that there's there's something to be said for giving someone time to kind of grow into the position themselves because he's, you know, the, the, the position group and how it was coached was molded in such a way. And now he's coming to take over. You got to give him his time to kind of put his flair or, you know, twist or spin on things at the same time. Yeah. Taylor's uh, wrong one. Taylor said, what team ran all over us this year besides quarterbacks? I mean, USC. If you remember, USC had a lot more success running the football than anyone thought they were going yes, to have. And, you know, ran all over them. I don't know. But they definitely, they're the one. They, they, I think they ended up, didn't they end up running for over 200 yards in that game? It wasn't, all, so. it wasn't all Caleb Williams. So, you know, that was the one to me. But, again, that was, I, I don't necessarily put that all on, you know, the, the defensive line and the defensive line coach. That had more to do, I think, with the fact that, Al Golden obviously switched up his scheme a little bit and thought that he was going to to try to stop Caleb Williams from a passing standpoint, and it kind of backfired mm -hmm. on him. You know, I think that had more to do with it than anything. What'd you think of the young linebackers, Jalen Sneed and Prince <laughs> Kali? I, you know, there was there was good and bad. You know, it, like when you look at at Jalen Sneed, I was watching the game again. You know, I watched it live. I watched it went through and, and watched it more a little bit more for the offense than the defense but I, i've been spent the last day or so watching more defensive stuff you know there was a big there was a big pass play where jalen sneed you know just lets the tight end go in the end you know and he ends up chasing that tight end down the middle of the field i think it was the one where you know it ended up being the fake kick that ended up being a touchdown i think it was that particular drive what start with him what what would you think about what you saw from sneed you know, this is a very interesting topic because a lot of you know, people, rightfully so, have been, I would almost say, demanding that Prince Kali and Jalen Sneed get more playing time. And what you have to realize is, yes, the athleticism is there and the athleticism in space is there. But there's something to be said about guys who line up correctly every play. They set the defense because at linebacker, you're setting the defense. You're setting your, your run strength. Um, and then also you have, you know, past responsibilities as well. I don't think that they played a bad game. I don't think that they played a great game, but you saw a lot of mental mistakes that were probably expected for younger players 
And specifically for guys who haven't had played that much this season, I think that is a very large contribute contributor to why they haven't been playing. Jalen Sneed had at least two personal foul penalties. Those that's 30 yards and automatic first downs. Can't be doing those. And on the play you talked about, he bit on play action when he has man responsibility on that tight end gets sucked up and has to backtrack. And now they get a big gain on it. I'm pretty sure that was on a third down as well yeah. on just a tight end seam, you know, up the field. And so again, are they going to make mistakes? Yes, but you can't make personal foul mistakes and you can't make, you know, formational mistakes where you're trying to set the defense because if you set the defense wrong or you don't align to strength or you set the wrong strength, then the whole scheme is could be, be thrown in the trash essentially because you are prepared for where you know where you're setting strength and where you're setting strength determines where everyone's going to line up. You know the the defensive line is going to have different shades. The linebackers are going to be maybe four yards off the ball or five yards off the ball. They might be in the A gap, the B gap. You know whatever it might be. Those are very important things. And so when guys can't do those things and they're making kind of silly you know 15 yard penalties, those are the reasons why they don't have much. Com- the coaches don't have as much confidence playing them, even though that they show you know obvious more natural ability i would say how much do you think just getting the more extensive play that that sneed got how much do you think that helps him as he goes into the spring and then looking toward next year as he potentially you know battles for more playing time no and i think that was a big benefit of him getting to play in this bowl game especially you know this is this was probably his greatest usage of the season. And it was in the game that theoretically matters the most, right? Like outside of maybe Ohio state and USC, but this is the bowl game. This is the acclimation of the entire season in one game. So like I said before, this is the bowl game is kind of like your final exam. So what has Jalen Sneed learned throughout the duration of this entire season, his entire freshman year, and how does it translate to the field? Well, I think that even if he didn't play to his, you know, best ability, stats wise and personal foul wise and all that stuff he at least builds his confidence and knows that he can do it and can kind of get these kind of errors out of his system right because they're going to happen to whoever regardless no one walks out there and is the perfect player their first time at it yeah and the one thing that surprised me a little bit about Jalen Sneed is they they had him do some different things in that game where like they would line him up just on the edge and had him rushing. And sometimes he got pushed around a little bit. And then obviously, like we were talking about, you know, in coverage, he blew a man to man assignment against the tight end. But, but I I was a little bit surprised just the amount of times they put him on the edge and tried to have him rush the quarterback rather than just have him play out there as a true Rover type guy. But I don't know. Let me find this comment from Tyler. What did you think about this? Tyler said linebackers were in bad position and terrible gap fillers. Uh, are we talking specifically this game? Are we talking, you know, throughout the season? I, I do think throughout the season, these linebackers struggled with gap fills and being able to, to finish plays as tacklers. I think that was a very bad strength of, of these linebackers. I, I think that was the biggest weakness of this linebacker group is guys could potentially get to the hole, but they're not, you know, they're not they're not filling tackle or making the tackles. And then sometimes they're getting to the hole too late, but they're, they're kind of cleaning up tackles. It never felt like it was a true fill the gap, make a strong tackle all in one. Yeah, like I, I think that there was some of that in the Gator Bowl early on. But again, I think it was because South Carolina was throwing so much new stuff out there trying to confuse Notre Dame. And it did cause some confusion. That's where they had some success. But once they. Once they figured some things out formationally and and everything else, and like, you know, I I realize everyone likes to rip J.D. Bertrand, but J.D. Bertrand had a great game in the Gator Bowl. You know, like you talk about tackling in space and open field and all those different things. J.D. Bertrand, like, he was the one who knew where he was supposed to be, and he's, you know, trying to move guys around and all that, you know, again – I don't think you can probably take, you know, probably the first, you know, four or so possessions. You've got to kind of remove that a little bit because that's when they were all out there trying to figure things out together, both the coaching staff and the players, because there was so much different personnel than they were used to seeing in different formations than what they were used to seeing. And, and South Carolina was just kind of throwing the kitchen sink at them, trying to confuse them, you know, going with some gadgets and some different things like that. But as the game went on, 
J.D. Bertrand once again ends up being the leading tackler and made a lot of really good plays out there. Yeah, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about this Anthony Solomon comment. I find it odd that the position on defense that struggled the most had Golden, Freeman, and Laronitis as coaches, and I completely agree with that. It's, But I think that shows the dual complexity of how hard it is to play linebacker, and I'm not just saying that out of biasy. You know, defensive linemen – 90% of the time are concerned about one thing, right? Stopping the run or rushing the passer. Like they yeah. don't have to worry about pass coverage. You know, they're, they're, they're getting they how fast can they get to the guy with the ball essentially is their job. Secondary. They're probably 90, 90% pass except for maybe, you know, if a swing play is on the edge or if a safety has to come down and fill the gap, they, they might be 80, 85, 90%, you know, pass is their primary concern. But when you're playing linebacker, Every play is 50-50 pass or run and equal responsibilities. You know, you have to be here on run and you have to be here on pass and in a new defense and a, probably a defense that is at a high level because it's, you know, Al Golins, he comes from the NFL. He's going to have a defense that's a little more nuanced. I think it just shows how hard it is to play linebacker, no matter if you have Marcus Freeman, Laronitis, Al Golden all teaching you things. It's hard to play linebacker at that level because you have so many responsibilities that you have to, you have to set the defense. Yeah. You have to be worried about pass. You have to be worried about run. There's a lot going on in a span of not that much time. And so I just think the the more these guys get comfortable and had gotten comfortable throughout the season, the more we saw their performance improve. And I think that's only going to be carried over into next season, especially for someone like who JD Bertrand, who had drastic improvement, had a great bowl game to, you know, to, to punctuate his season and now he's going to be, you know, coming back again next season. So I think you're going to see a, a great improvement out of the linebacker group next season. What do you think about Prince Kali? We got to see uh, some more of him out there in the Gator Bowl, too. Yeah, I thought, again, Prince Kali did some things that were very good. But again, there was there are reasons why he, you know, at, at, even though people wanted to see him play more, there were things that were holding him back. And I'm sure everyone saw it in the first quarter because I've seen it here in the chat. You know, Marcus Freeman was was more involved in on the defense. And when Prince Kali came off the field, you I can't remember what it was. He was involved. getting right. He was getting an earful. From, it was the play. It was the play where they ended up fumbling on the near side. But Kali, you know, was lucky get in position on the far side. Yes. Yeah, they're, 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 they're fortunate they didn't go the other direction with the ball. Exactly. So what Marcus Freeman was, you know, this is my speculation, but I'm, I'm pretty confident in what Marcus Freeman was getting on him about is because you could see him kind of, you, you know, using these gestures, Marcus Freeman, is he's basically telling Kali, you don't know what the strength of the formation is and you're completely aligned, you know, lined up wrong. And if they had not fumbled that play, there's a large chance that that play breaks for a lot of yards. And so, again, it goes back to if you can't get lined up uh, as a linebacker pre-snap, you are automatic – what's the word? You automatically are putting your defense at a deficit because – even if it doesn't even have to be a great play, just one guy out of place, the whole play can break. And so yeah. that's what Marcus Freeman was getting on him about. And again, that's why just lining up is half the battle, setting the strength of the defense and knowing where you line up is the other half of the battle at the same time. So again, I thought both those guys showed a lot of great things, but they also showed a lot of rookie mistakes. And those are what have been holding them back this season. Yeah. And that's, you know, the more they got out there, the more you kind of saw, okay, you know, this this is obviously why they're not out there more. They're still, as talented as they are, there's still growth and learning for these guys to do. So, but again, that's what you've got a whole off season now for. And the fact that they've been in this system for a year and everyone else, I think you might've mentioned it, the fact that your third defensive coordinator in in three years and even maybe as similar as the systems appear to everybody else that's still a lot to relearn on a year-to-year -year basis even for the veterans yeah and I, I guess what i'll close with specifically to sneed and kali is i respect and i admire the coach's willingness to put those guys out there because they could have simply just said we're gonna roll with our guys and the, they probably could have got the job done right like maris bertrand kaiser all those guys could have got the job done, but they wanted and they made an emphasis to get these guys in there. And, and I think that, yeah. yes, and I think that's a big, you know, a big step in development and advancement. And I don't know that we would see the same under the previous regime, I, I guess is what I'm saying also. So I very yeah. much admire 
the, the defensive staff willing to roll the dice and letting these young guys get this experience out there in a game that has a lot of, you know, riding on it. It's a bowl game against an SEC opponent. Both teams are eight and four getting to nine wins and setting, you know, the tone for the next season is very crucial. So I admire the, the coaching staff for rolling the dice on those two guys. Yeah. Gavin asks, is that a player problem or a scheme problem? Because you want your defense to be complex. Doesn't mean it has to be too complex for your players too. And I mean, we, I think we talked about this, especially earlier in the season. It seemed like there was probably too much schematic wise that, that Al Golden might've been trying to do. Like there was too much on these guys plates and they weren't able, you know, to play as naturally as they want. I, you know, I, I do agree with that to an extent. Do you? Yeah, I do. I, I still, I think that there's something to be said for, you know, asking too much of guys and, and making things overly complicated, but still making it, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, still making it complex enough to give, you know, the opponent fits. You don't want something so simple and basic that a team can just come out and have their way with you. But at the same time, you don't want guys not understanding what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Someone else who had a good game was Jordan Botello getting to make his first start of the season. And he looked good. He had nine total pressures against South Carolina, you know, made some plays in the backfield, both the sack tackle for loss. What did you think of uh, what you saw from him? You had, you had Botello and Justin Adam Alola playing opposite of each other quite a bit out there. Yeah. I thought that Botello clearly had, you know, the best game of his career. Like you talked about, he had a pass rush win percentage of nearly 21%. He had two sacks and added two solo tackles along the way. Um, and he really stepped up in Foskey's, you know, absence. That was a big question of could the D-line do enough, you know, with Adam Ayola not playing um, and Foskey being out. And I thought that they did a great job, largely because of someone, you know, like Botello. So I think that that is a great indication of what's, you know, to come going forward. Um, and again, it gives someone confidence that they know what they're doing and, they, and that they can have – success and and I think the most admirable thing on on Botello's end in this game and I think this is what kind of you know people got to realize too sometimes is even if you aren't making a sack or making the tackle if you are doing enough the pass win percentage like you were talking about the you know the 21 percent if you're doing that and disrupting plays that's almost as good as a sack or a tackle for loss because you're setting right. up someone else to make the play because you beat your guy so bad that they need to alter the course of what they're doing. And so I know it doesn't show up on the stat sheet stat sheets. But that's something like Micah Parsons is extremely good at is even when he's not getting sacks or tackles for loss, he's, he's completely disrupting. Yeah. disrupting the play and it allows for other guys, you know, to, to, to make a play in, in, in his absence. Yeah. And this, you know, this is a good point too you know and it's i think it's something that you see when you have nfl guys come back to college you know anthony points out golden has to remember these kids don't have the time to invest in the defensive scheme like nfl players do you know because it's obviously a full-time job in the nfl and you're at notre dame and like you know one thing al golden talked about early on was he kept talking about oh these guys are so smart and they get it and they can you know absorb all this stuff and and maybe you know, maybe he went too far with some of that because when you get them in August before and, you know, before school has started, they, again, they have more time for that. But when school starts and you're still implementing so much of this stuff, there's a lot on their plates. So as smart as they are, it just seemed like there was probably too much on their plates early on. So, yeah, again, we'll I see how he adjusts and how just – Everyone have it, you know, everyone who's currently on the roster having a year in this system helps them as they get into spring and in fall training camp again next year. Yeah, I guess the, the number one thing I, I'm most confused about, and I know we all want to see the best players on the field at one time. And we know that athletically Sneed and Kali are the best, you know, at, at the linebacker position at Notre Dame right now. But it just seems like that the, we that we have gone kind of defense of you know Sneed, Kali, and not realize guys like JD Bertrand have been playing out of their minds, and it's not uncommon for true freshman linebackers to not fully you know start 
or be in a role for a defense. And so the fact that these guys got playing time this year on special teams, got some snaps on defense, I think is very huge for their development. And I don't think it just because they performed bad or had some kind of deficiencies, I don't think that that's a direct correlation to the coaching. I think that it goes both ways. But at the end of the day, I still think that these guys are young. And it's a big transition from high school to college. Like when I tra- I didn't even know about pulling guards and tackles when I was in high school, let alone what coverage I need to be in. Like there is a lot of information to process at one time. And so, again, these guys are true freshmen, and I understand that they're really good and really highly rated, but you still have to give them time and you have to let them soak in the defense. Like it is a lot. It is a lot to, to try to, you know, I remember sitting in some of my first meetings in training camp and we're going over defense and I'm just sitting there like lost the entire time. And I thought I was the guy that was going to be smart and I would be able to pick up the defense and, you know, da, 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 da. But it's, it's hard to learn these things, especially in two weeks when you have install, and then you have a guy like JD Bertrand, who's been playing, you know, X years before these guys. And it's just that much easier for them. Cause I remember in my second year, like I, I, the, the way the defense just clicked was so much better compared to my first year. So I kind of went on a rant there, but at the no, same time, I, I think that's I just very helpful put, because you played the position perspective into what's you played going the position on. at the college level, and it's the position that everyone's picking apart right now. I don't think that most people understand just how complicated it is because th- those guys, as the linebackers, basically have to know everything. They've got to know, know where the entire ins and outs. Yes. Of the entire defense. Like you have to know everything. You got to set strength. You got to know where you're going, pass and run wise. Again, all in a span of like three seconds pre snap. So I just kind of wanted to talk through that a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, I think everyone's, you know, had a had a good time venting on some of this stuff <laughs> tonight. But you know, I wanted to mention the fake punt that Braden Lindsay had, because again, I was, you know, I saw that when I was rewatching the game again today. And it's just amazing how simple that turned out to be. And it worked because South Carolina's left side of their line, the right side of the line for Notre Dame was basically in safe mode. Like they were, there was no disruption from that side of the line. There was no penetration and Brian Mason, but Mar- Marcus Freeman and, you know, via Brian Mason, talked afterwards about how, you know, Notre Dame had punted previously. And that's what you do, you know, that first time you punt, it's like, okay, you look for something. Are we getting the look that we need? And he saw that there was basically passivity on that side. And when there's no disruption, you know, they're not going to penetrate. You can basically use that passiveness against them. They were, you know, they were kind of sitting there sort of looking to see if there was going to be a fake. And by doing that, it made them that much easier for Notre Dame to block. And they just do that little shovel pass and off goes Braden Lindsay for what, 20 plus yards. It was really the simplicity of the whole thing. Again, just using the fact that South Carolina was as passive as they were against them. Yeah. And honestly, when I was watching in live time, I saw Lindsay go in motion. And I was like, what is going on here? I don't you see think Sherwood that, like waving at him. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that you. I've seen that, you know, really like sometimes you see a, a, a gunner kind of motion. They might go like instead of splitting out the gunners one on one, they you motion one guy over and then you go dual gunners one side. But I don't know. I just I can't remember the last time I saw motion pre snap on a punt. Excuse me for a second. But really, realistically, what made that play work uh, was the three linebackers who were blocking out in front of Lindsay on that play and setting the edge. And I thought it was perfectly executed by guys like Bertrand and getting out there and being lead blockers for Lindsay as he's trying to get around the corner. Because one, there's obviously the art of surprise, but two, you still have to execute and hit your blocks. And I think that was the kind of underrated aspect of it. We all know Lindsay's got speed. And once he hits the corner, it's kind of game over, but you still got to set the edge and, you know, get on these blocks. And so I thought the execution of the play was more fascinating than, than the play itself, if that makes sense. No, it does. You know, and because you're right, you don't typically see that kind of motion, but again, because you're bringing that motion, you're bringing Lindsay from the left coming through the backfield and the snap is going, you know, to that, that up man and it's a little shovel pass the offensive linemen are standing up so you're kind of you know that uh, 
Lindsay and the up man are shielded a little bit. So it's hard for anybody really to see. And then the next thing you know, boom, you know, again, he's coming around the edge, perfectly sealed off on the edge that, you know, they set it and, and it's, and it's an easy run because he kind of gets, you know, again, the, the only real disruption came from Notre Dame's left side. So even if they're penetrating there, Lindsay is already past there. So you don't have to worry about like him getting bumped off coming across in that motion through the backfield. And it's just, you know, an easy snap to the up man and the shovel to the, to that receiver. Who's got a full, st- a full head of steam and he's fast to begin with. And he hits it. I thought it was just, it was, it was beautiful design, beautiful execution. Yeah. And the last thing I'll really say about it. And, and another reason why I, I liked it so much is oftentimes you see these one, the biggest the, when, when trying to overall have success on a play like this, the, the number one thing is the art of surprise. But the number two thing is just the play design itself. And I feel like sometimes guys get too caught up with the perfect kind of trick play. But I really thought the simplicity of it is what made it so easy and executable for Notre Dame. Because it's not like all these different guys are pulling or it's like a counter or like, you know, you're faking one way and going to the other. It was literally just a snap and a pitch to the guy as he's going and mo- it almost just looked like an offensive play, right? Like it, it wasn't anything crazy. So again, another reason why I liked that play so much, it was so easy to execute. There wasn't a lot of chances for air. It was a simple pitch or, you know, snap the ball, pitch it to the guy as he's going in motion and just hope your guys get blocks on the edge. Yep. I agree. Anthony is uh, asking change of subject. What choice was made for the Friday show? The name of the Friday show, who came up with the selection? Uh, we have not been able to come to any kind of consensus on it is still a, up uh, on a name. And, you know, part of that it has to do with the boss. And, you know, it's like we haven't seen the choice that everyone can agree on at this point. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're kind of putting that on the back burner for right now. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening with that. But that's definitely a back burner right now but I we do appreciate tune in on all the suggestions there's just been nothing nothing that can uh can be agreed upon at this point pretty much where we are jesse are you ready for rapid fire i am done ranting about al golden's <laughs> above average to pretty solid defense and i'm ready for some rapid fire let's do it so here's a tweet from former notre dame defensive back troy pride jr over the weekend quote Buckner either has me lit or pisses me off end quote so what do you think about Troy Pride Jr.'s tweet <laughs> uh you know I, I think I I hundred percent agree with what he's saying in in a you know in a lack of better words um but really it, it, you know what did what did Buckner do in this game I understand Reese shouldn't have called a, a pass play in the red zone after all that running but Buckner still has to throw the ball and still threw the interception Right, it's like Russell Wilson's play in the Super Bowl. I, we all know that Marshawn Lynch should have got the handoff, but Wilson still dropped back and threw the interception. Right, and so the pick sixes are, you know, when you spot a team fourteen points, and it, that's going to piss you off. Or when a team goes up thirty-one to twenty-four, and on the ensuing drive you throw an interception and give them the ball in plus territory, that's going to piss you off. But then when you see a Buckner 10, 15 yard quarterback, you know, counter power into the red zone. You're like, this has me pretty lit. This is what we've been missing all year. That's a third, right. <laughs> a third dimension in the red zone. So I thought it was put perfectly and I completely agree with them. But unfortunately, you know, this is Buckner's first game back after serious injury, you know, having the confidence to throw the ball compared to what the offensive line looks like in Ohio state and Marshall games, there were going to be some of these things kind of ironed out, but it was like the good of the good and the bad of the bad with Buckner yeah. in that game. It's it's like, you know, it's it's very Brett Favre, basically, you know, like gunslinger Brett Favre. He could make, you know, plays that that make your draw drop in one instance, and then he's throwing a stupid interception the next. <laughs> but because he's Brett Favre, you're willing to live with it. Now, I'm obviously not calling Tyler Buckner Brett Favre, but, you know, that's, that's kind of what I would compare it to, you know, with that kind of swinging – of emotion, the highs and lows. Someone tweeted a reply to Troy Pride Jr. that I love. 
They said, I had a girlfriend in high school like that. And I just feel like a lot of people can probably relate to that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's either got me lit or just totally pisses me off, you know, <laughs> and depending on what day or maybe what minute it happens to be. But, you know, I, I, I think the entirety of what we saw from Buckner, it, it definitely backs up what Pride said, like you were talking about, because the highs were higher than anything that we saw from Drew Pine, you know. But the two pick sixes were lower than anything that we saw from Drew Pine. But, you know, again, you know, like one is a deflected ball at the line of scrimmage. We saw that plenty of times from Drew Pine. That very easily could have been him. And Pine started 10 games this season. Buckner started three with four months, obviously, in between starts number two and three. Pine finished the season with a 69.3 quarterback rating against USC. Buckner had a slightly better 60. 69.5 against South Carolina, again, with 16 weeks in between starts. And, you know, Pine was never going to give you what Buckner can with his legs. You know, he, he ran for a little over 100 yards and two touchdowns all season. Pine had more than half a hundred and two touchdowns of his own, you know, and obviously five total touchdowns. So, you know, there were, there were peaks and valleys for sure. But, you know, we knew going in that Buckner was going to make some mistakes because he's still very inexperienced. And, you know, just his third start since his junior year of high school and his first win as a starting quarterback since he was in high school. So you can look at the lows, but, you know, the, the, the balance of the whole thing is there's just still a pretty raw quarterback there who made a lot of strides after being out for as long as he did. So there's 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 still a lot of a, a promise, a lot of good stuff there. But but Troy Pride was definitely right. <laughs> you know, I think everyone was riding those highs and lows along with him out there Saturday. So here's another tweet. This one from former Irish linebacker Drew Tranquil, who's of course with the LA Chargers right now. Tranquil says, in college football, offense wins championships. So do you buy or sell that, Jesse? Sorry, Unmute I'm, yourself. <laughs> I'm going through a little coughing attack here, so I hope I can. I can tell you got you got something to drink there. Yeah, I've been chugging it down, but uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, that that is a hundred percent true, considering what we saw um, out of the semifinal games uh, this weekend, and I think you know forty-one to forty-two with Georgia and Ohio State, and then fifty-one to forty-five in the Michigan and TCU game. And these are Michigan and Georgia were considered some of the top defenses in the country throughout the entire season. And so when I saw these scores on New Year's Eve, as I'm, you know, taking on a little whiskey drink myself, I'm thinking what's going on here because these are supposed to be the best defenses. I expected kind of, you know, some, some lower scoring, but when you're putting, you know, when all four teams score in the forties, I think it's easy to say that college football turns into, you know, who has the best offense. I completely agree, and I'll let you kind of clear your throat there <laughs> while I try to give my response. I went back and looked, and you know, it it seems like historically, even without looking at the numbers, that you know, there we've seen a lot of offense in the semifinals and the championship games, and this this is now the ninth year of the college football playoff. So there have been eight previous playoff champions. The winner in the national championship game has scored at least. 42 points five of the eight times and two other times they scored at least 33 and only once when Alabama played Georgia in the overtime game 26 23 five years ago did the winner not break 30 points and you said it not only are these teams putting up those kind of points they're doing it against some of the better defensive teams in the country whether it's Georgia or Alabama or Clemson on down the line, I completely agree. You know, like you look at the winners of the semifinal games, the average score in the 18 semifinal of the winners of the 18 semifinals over the last nine years, 34 and a half points. So you've got to be dynamic offensively. You have to have more than one way to score. You've got, you know, with few exceptions, you'd better have a really good quarterback because the teams that have played in the playoffs have been filled with first-round NFL draft picks and Heisman Trophy winners, not just the quarterbacks, but, you know, receivers as well, you know, and and running backs. 
you can't be just a good defensive team because the offenses in college football have just gone to such a different level over the last few years. You've got to have skill across the board on offense. And again, you can't just be a one-dimensional team. Notre Dame's getting closer with these recruiting classes that they're getting, that they're getting, they're getting, you know, more dynamic offensive players. And that's what it's ultimately going to take. Like when you talk about closing the gap, you know, turning the corner, all that kind of stuff, you've got to have those kind of players offensively. I mean, look at the the playoff appearances that Notre Dame has been in. It's been a lack of not being able to keep up offensively, right? And so I, I, I'm just in complete agreement. I think there's something to be said to have a, a solid defense throughout the regular season, but come playoff time, your offense better be putting up 30 points at least if they think that they're going to have a chance of winning. So I, I'm in agreement with uh, with what Mr. Tranquil was saying. Yeah. C-Mac has given you some advice. Ricola has Vicks Vapor Rub. In I taste so. it. It's the worst part. You get down to the end and it just tastes like you're just eating rub or Vicks Vapor Rub. Yeah, I know. I know. And uh, Spencer, sa- Spencer says, Irish need to figure out NIL, be a very competitive institution with NIL. I don't know if you saw today, but Benjamin Morrison – uh, signed an NIL deal with uh, a, a trading card company, and he's going to go do an uh, autograph and photo session later this month. So again, there's NIL there. It's just that Notre Dame is not using the NIL the way a lot of these other schools are illegally using the NIL as inducements to get the kids to school. There's NIL there, plenty of NIL opportunities. So my next question for you, Jesse. Is losing in the college football playoff semifinals worse for Michigan or Ohio State? Oh, this is a this is a un this is a no doubter for me. It is a worse, far worse for Michigan this year. Um, Ohio State has proven success in the college football playoff. They were the heavy underdog against Georgia. If I remember right, everyone was saying that Georgia would blow them out. They'd be a multiple score game. It wouldn't be close. I thought personally, Ohio State would keep it close. I thought they had a chance of pulling out the upset, and that almost, you know, came to light if a, if a field goal kicker could just kick it straight. But, you know, it, Michigan is a different story because they got embarrassed by a very good Georgia team last year, right? And so, okay, first time in the playoffs, go against the team that ends up winning it all, a very good Georgia team, solid defense, okay, whatever. This year, you get in, and everyone doesn't want to let TCU in. TCU's the underdog. And I thought Michigan kind of looked past TCU and was anticipating this Georgia matchup. And this is the best chance that Michigan has had at a national championship in a very long time, a very fair opponent in TCU in which I thought that they should have beat and they get upset by TCU. So for me, this is a big, big loss for Michigan. And and the last thing I'll say, and I know it's hard to compare this because it's not straight apples to apples, but you know, all those Michigan fans out there, that gave Notre Dame crap for how they lost in the in the playoffs. Notre Dame had to play generational Alabama and Clemson team, right. and you're handed a TCU opponent that is they're good, but they're not near the same opponents that the playoffs have seen in the past. And you and they're bragging about how this three three five defense that they run, you know, is going to be so easy to run through at all this stuff. Right? How that work? And so I just thought it was very embarrassing on Michigan's fact because. They blew their bag on, a, to me, it was a very good opportunity to get back to the national championship this season. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's Michigan as well. I think they've reached their ceiling, you know, based on how they do things, their mode of operation. And now you look at Jim Harbaugh and there's all this NFL talk with Jim Harbaugh out there. And, it, you know, it, it, look, some, someone was just, you know, apparently there's a story about it close to a deal. With Carolina, I haven't seen anything specific to that, but the Denver Broncos have been in on Harbaugh. There's been talk with the Colts. There was a report yesterday saying that if Jim Harbaugh is made a legitimate deal by an NFL team, he's gone. So, you know, between the fact that that where Michigan is, and just like you talked about, the generational teams that Notre Dame had to play in their college football playoff semifinals compared to what Michigan had to play they were handed a golden opportunity and again comes back who had the more dynamic better offense tcu did and it it beat michigan now the pick six has definitely helped tcu 
as well quite a bit. But It looks like we potentially might be back here. It seems as if the Michigan gods have uh, struck us down for our negative commentary. You know, while while we uh, 
while we wait, why don't why don't you guys just throw some of maybe your questions that you have into the uh, into the chat, and I'll, I'll give my best answer as we try to re reboot everything. We'll do a mini Jesse Q and A session. Uh, no, not currently in the greatest. Thank you for the shirt compliment. But I have been pretty sick all week, so uh, hoping to recover soon. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sean doesn't have any cats. My mom would never allow cats um, in the house and our dog is really old, but they recently moved a couple years ago and they, they always seem to have, uh, internet issues. I can see you, but I can't hear you. Hang on. You're doing like a clicky noise. Kind of, uh, Anthony, I believe Tyler can be a championship level quarterback. Um, as long as he continues to progress, I thought he showed, a lot of good things in that bowl game. If he can cut down on the turnovers and giving the other team points, that's a great start. But I thought for his his first showing with the with the offensive line in a row. How about game, now? There we go. Now you're back. I can hear you. I think it'll get really interesting though. Um, next season, if Hartman ends up at Notre Dame, because I don't know what you would value more at Notre Dame. Do you want the success this that season with Hartman and everything that he brings, or are you more interested in developing your quarterback uh, in Tyler Buckner? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. That was... Uh... Am I still here? You were. You you are here again. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm seeing <laughs> just all kinds of weird stuff happening with the internet. I don't know if it's because of this weather that's going on in the area or what, but there are obviously some major issues coming, you know, going on going on right now. Um it sounds like the Michigan people uh rained down on our parade because they knew we were talking so much crap about them. <laughs> Maybe that's it. You know, maybe it's just as simple as that. Uh, C-Mac was asking earlier if Vince's wife punished him for doing six hours of podcasts yesterday. I cannot speak to that. But <laughs> should we should we try to, to finish rapid fire here? I say so, because we can at least, you know, for, for the downloadable version, we could edit out the part where you uh, dropped out. So I, I still yeah. think there's... Uh, some great questions on the table here. I opened up the chat while you were gone and did a mini Jesse Q and a session. So. Okay. Nice. Nice. Well, we managed to get through anyway. I'm glad you make it. I don't have Verizon by the way. <laughs> C-Mac has been on you about your internet connection. It's been quite funny. He said that the Just... cat pissed on your ethernet cable and I had to inform him that our mother or my mom, <laughs> your wife would never ever allow a cat in a house. I don't think that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay. So, I tell you what, um, let me let me ask you this. So I'm wearing this T-shirt. I don't know if anyone's even noticed it. It's I'll move the microphone here so you can see it. This is 10 years old this week. This is from the BCS championship game, which you and I both attended. The 2012-2013 BCS championship game between Notre Dame and Alabama. And I've heard people say that you should never wear like hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, you know, whatever memorabilia from big games where your team lost, whether it's the World Series, the Super Bowl, college football, whatever it happens to be. Do you buy or sell that? Do you have to retire the stuff that you buy from uh, big events where your team loses? Oh, that's a big sell for me. I know there's no such thing as a participation trophy, at least in my books, but your team making it there, 
uh, you know, I have tons of stuff from that season. I have, you know, things I brought back with me. Um, you know, it, it was, I was rocking South beach, Derek. I was a fresh, <laughs> like junior in high school running around in South beach, met some kind of famous people. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's nothing wrong with it because it's still a monumental, you know, it, it's what it means to you personally, win or lose. You don't have to be distraught about that. You can be happy with the experience of getting to go there. And that's what I'll always remember is I was able to go with a lot of friends. You know, we drove down there. We met Pitbull on the streets or sorry, we did, Pitbull did a pop-up concert and we were like front row. And at one point he like put his arms down and used our shoulders to prop himself up. We met a, a famous um, rapper in the middle of the streets in, in downtown South beach. Uh, you know, we stayed at a hotel. The game was kind of like the last thing I remember for obvious reasons, but the experience itself <laughs> was a ton of fun. And so the last thing anyone wants to remember. <laughs> yeah. So like, I, I always will keep my memorabilia, even if it's, you know, win or lose, cause it's still get, being grateful for the opportunity to go down there regardless of win or loss. Yeah. And I mean, you typically like I do it, it's like you buy the stuff before the game because like you see it and you don't want the good stuff to be gone by the time the game rolls around so you, you've got it and then obviously it stinks if your team loses especially if it's a blowout like that but this is actually I, I have not worn this shirt very often but I was I was reaching in the closet today and I was like you know what the heck I haven't I haven't worn that in a while this is the 10 year anniversary I'll throw it on I completely agree because it's still it's still like a you know a big moment just your team getting there. Like I went and saw the Royals in the World Series when they made it in 2014. They lost that one to the Giants, but I had like my hat and the t-shirt and all that stuff. Fortunately, they won the next year, so like that stuff you wear a little bit more often, but still it's like it's a, it's a big big moment when your team gets there. And you you shell out a lot of money to buy that stuff and to go. So, I don't think you just pitch it because they lose. You might not wear it quite as often put it back <laughs> put it back all right td okay so this is the last question tonight and there was a little bit of controversy earlier this weekend and i just pushed the wrong button on my screen here just like technology does not want to help me out here tonight um so there was some controversy Coming out of the Notre Dame women's basketball team's 85 to 47 win over Boston College Sunday. Longtime TV analyst Deb Antonelli was doing the game on the ACC network along with play by play announcer Jen Hildreth. So Antonelli said some things about Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron that upset Olivia Miles, who tweeted about it. Now I'll read the tweet. Here in a few minutes, but I'm going to play the audio of what Antonelli said first, and then we'll talk about it. So this is what Deb Antonelli said. It's in the third quarter of Notre Dame's blowout win over Boston College, and she kind of veers into a different line of conversation than maybe you're used to, and this is what upset um, Olivia Miles. So have a listen to what Deb Antonelli said during the TV broadcast Sunday. Well, Miles is flashy. Citron is not. She is solid. And she is an excellent basketball player. She handles. She passes. She sees the floor. She can score. She understands personnel on the defensive end. It'd be interesting if you pulled the coaches in the ACC, like... Which player would you rather have, Miles or Citron? I think it'd be a really interesting conversation because they're both so good. I think there'd be a lot of coaches in the league that would really prefer Citron. Oh. Hmm. That is interesting. Well, I mean, because Miles certainly produces at a high clip. I mean, she leads this Notre Dame team in scoring, rebounding, assists, skills. It's always a triple-double threat. Does have some turnovers that come along with that that flash, that flair that she loves to play with. And Citron well, named ACC C Freshman of the Year last year. I mean, she's a 50, 40, almost 90. She's 88% mm -hmm. from the three from the free throw line. So that's why I say, when you look at her efficiency, her numbers are about, you know, her, she's just a better shooter than Miles is. Miles is a better passer. 
It's interesting though. I think it would be um maybe I'll take a silent poll, the man on the street kind of poll, and see what, what what I can come up with. Well, who would you take if you were coaching? Well, I like Citron. I mean, I, that's not to diminish my like for Olivia Miles. It's just that I think I would take Citron because of all the things, the way she shoots the ball. Here comes Miles. They're both capable of being first team all ACC, but not both of them could be an All-American. Only one might be, maybe. And I think because of the flash and the attention and what Miles does for Notre Dame is probably giving her a little bit of an edge in the LIV system, but not much. It's good conversation. Yeah. She picks up the offensive foul on that play. She was a first team all ACC selection last year, an honorable mention all American by AP. And that and that's not saying anything negative about Miles. It's just a preference, I think. Now I'm gonna pull the coaches and see what I can come up with. <laughs> I mean we got Kenny Brooks's boat named. We can at least pull we the did. coaches and find out, <laughs> you know, who who they would prefer. Um, you know anonymously, not giving up. See, look at that play. This is drawn with a dot Smooth. to the bucket. <laughs> yes, and making it very clear that there is, as you've said, utmost respect, and these are two tremendous players. This is a great choice either way. And, and so that was Jen Hildreth there at the end, who it seemed to me, if you're listening to Jen, the play-by-play -play announcer, she was trying to avoid this conversation as much as possible, but uh, Deb Antonelli kept pushing this conversation. And so here's what Olivia Miles tweeted about this after the game. Quote, pinning two teammates against each other is uncalled for and creates unnecessary tension where there doesn't need to be any. We are one team and we all work to play for the better of the university Everything else does not matter. Go Irish, end quote. That's from Olivia Miles. And here is Antonelli's Twitter response to that. Quote, talk about Olivia Miles slash Sonia Citron conversation about two good players. Didn't say anything negative about either. Listen to conversation and hear subjective commentary, not negative. Which player would you pick if you only get to pick one, Olivia or Sonia? Who would coaches in ACC pick, end quote. So, Jess, there's a lot there you got to hear. I think that the context of this is important. That's why I played, you know, an audio clip that was a little bit longer than we typically would. So you can hear what Deb Antonelli was saying. You've played sports your entire life. You know, you've been on a lot of different teams, you know, youth, travel, high school, college, the whole thing. So my question is, do you think what Deb Antonelli was talking about here was appropriate conversation for a game broadcast no i don't think that it was appropriate conversation for a game broadcast but here's what i'm going to say i i enjoy the discussion about the players but i don't think you have to narrate it in a way that pins them against each other why are we not talking about how great they are in unison together exactly. and how they complement each other's game that's the only i think everything is okay until she starts talking about well, who would you pick? Or it basically where you have to decide between one or two. I think exactly. the commentary and the subjectiveness is fine. You're highlighting what both players are good at. You're highlighting maybe kind of the what some of the minor deficiencies that both players have. But there's no reason that you need to draw a line and say, if I, you know, as an ex coach, this is who I would pick and I'm going to run a poll of who I would pick. It should be talking about how they work together, and what they are able to provide the Notre Dame team and how they contribute to Notre Dame's overall success as a team. That's exactly right. And here's how I come at this, because we obviously live in a Twitter hot take world where everyone has an opinion, and that's fine, but we see those opinions shared all the time. So it doesn't feel that unusual to see and hear these kind of opinions and takes. But it's the time and place that we're hearing it. I've been doing play-by-play -play and working in radio, you know, doing talk shows and for almost 30 years now at this point. And I don't know exactly how many games I've called in that time. I'm probably pushing somewhere around 2,000 or so games that I've called in those 30 years. And never in any of those games that I've called did it ever cross my mind to look at a team with two good players and go, 
well, which one of those two players would I rather have? They're playing together. You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose which one you'd rather have. Just like you said, it's how they play together. My first season calling Notre Dame women's games was when Neil Ivey was in her last year, her fifth year at Notre Dame, when they won the national championship. You know, she was the point guard. Ruth Riley was an All-American center that year as well. And never did it come into my mind to say, well, who would you rather have, Neil Livey or Ruth Riley? Or, you know, Alicia Retai, who is one of the better three-point shooters in the country. Or Kelly Seaman, who is, you know, a great power forward for that team as well. Those kind of questions are not for game broadcasts, for one. They're not, you know, th those are for hot take shows and for sports talk shows. Like, it's one thing to have that conversation if you're on, you know, again, like a hot take show or a talk show like this. It serves no purpose to anyone to compare two teammates to each other on the same team when you're on live air calling a game with a microphone in front of your mouth. Because Olivia's right. All it does is serve to, to drive a wedge between teammates who, by the way, get along great and who played with each other before they ever committed to Notre Dame and who've got great chemistry playing together, you know, to what you're talking about. Talk about how they how they go together, how they work together, how they complement each other, the way they know each other. You know, that's what you talk about in the broadcast. And to go even, you know, so far as to say during the game that she would actually pick one over the other. Right. That was where Elliot, it went crazy. Yeah. What all she did, she has given up all appearance of any objectivity going forward when she talks about either of these two players now, Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron. Because viewers now, you know, viewers already have their own notion of announcer bias and, and all this stuff when they watch a game. And so now what Antonelli has done is told everyone that she has full bias toward one player over the other. And so what if Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron went out and did a poll of their own and they asked coaches and players, who would you rather have call your game, Deb Antonelli or Jen Hildreth, who again, were, you know, were the two announcers calling this game together, you know, what would that create some friction between these two? You know, once once those results go public or even once they start talking about it, not to mention the ego blow to whoever comes up on the short end of this whole thing. You know, because again, I've called a ton of games in my life and there's always a chance in a game, you know, that it's going to turn into a blowout. And, you know, I've had people ask me, well, what do you talk about when the game gets ugly, you know, when it turns into a blowout? Well, first and foremost, it's about preparing for the game itself as much as you can. Have as much information as you can for that broadcast in case that happens. So you've got more things to fall back on. And it's about the game that's in front of you still. And it felt to me like the game got a little bit lopsided early. It's still in the third quarter, which by the way, Boston College played their best quarter of the game in the third when when Deb Antonelli goes into this stuff but she either had nothing else to talk about or she had determined before the game that this was what she was going to talk about when the game got lopsided if that happened to me that's th those are the two only choices and so there are a lot of things that I would you know talk about on this show that I wouldn't talk about during a game and vice versa and comparing two teammates to each other I just I can't think of any time where I've watched a game broadcast and I've heard this, you know, like go all the way back to Bobby Hurley and Christian Leitner, like, and, and, or, or Grant Hill. Did anyone say, you know, like, well, would you rather have Bobby Hurley or, or, or Christian Leitner? You might say, would you rather build a team around a point guard or a forward slash center? You know, that kind of thing. I just, I, making this kind of comparison and then going so far as to say which one you would pick I think is far over the line for a game broadcast. I think it's completely uncalled for. Yeah, I 100% agree. All right. I don't know where else to go. <laughs> I think we both got our rants out after that. Everyone seems to be uh, on the same page with us, and now they want it to, to bleed into some Mike Bray action, what we think of Mike Bray. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, and I've, <laughs> you know, the bonus Mike Bray question do you believe it's time to move on from bray you know 
You want me to Mike go first? Mike Gray is a guy I've worked with. I hosted his first coach's show 20 plus years ago when you know we both came to town in his first season. And I think he has done a lot of great things for Notre Dame men's basketball. But when you look at, when you're talking about Mike Bray's philosophy has been, you've got to stay old. And then, you know, you mix some young guys into it and the whole thing, it's, it's not working. This is an old team. You've got a good young talent in JJ Starling. You had a good young talent in Blake Wesley last year, but I think that, I, I think that it's 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 gone off the edge at this point. I, I just I, I don't know how this season's going to be rescued. You know, I we I had Tom Noy on a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about would Notre Dame be better than 500 in the ACC. Tom thought they would. I just I didn't see it. And that was before these last two losses. I didn't see it. Now they're sitting here at, at 0 and 3 in the ACC with as veteran a team as he's ever had who have been together, most of them for the better part of five years. I just, it's, it, it just seems like, it seems like it's, it's reached its expiration point. It's expiration date at this point. Yeah. So I I've been kind of looking at it from a, an entire picture type kind of view. And, you know, since being at Notre Dame, this is, I believe his like 22nd or 23rd season He's got a, a, a 0.65 win percentage overall, a 0.57 win percentage in conference play. Uh, he's made the tournament 13 times and only missed what seems to be the difference of years that he's been coaching. So he's made the tournament more than he's not made the tournament. So it's just to me, how far are you willing just to, to be comfortable with consistent? And I think that's the biggest issue with Notre Dame men's basketball is it seems they are comfortable with Mike Bray's consistency, but unfortunately Mike Bray hasn't done anything besides those back-to-back -back elite eight appearances to, to really show you that they could win the entire thing. And so yeah, and you I mean, play for consistency, you play to win it every year. Unfortunately, it hasn't been, you know, the only consistency has been, you know, a downward trend in the last few years with the exception of last year where they got back to the tournament and that was great. And you're hoping, okay, maybe this program has returned a corner again. Maybe there's some new life, but it, we're obviously not seeing that right now. There were so many close calls against some inferior teams against, you know, let's be honest, a pretty weak non-conference schedule. And now look where they are right now. 0-3 in the ACC. And, you know, you've lost to teams like Florida State and to Syracuse who are not that good. Those are, those are wins that you needed to have if you were going to be competitive this season and it just really seems like it 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 might be time for a new voice and kind of you know like a new a new energy around the program and it's nothing nothing personal because i mean i think everyone in the media likes mike bray you know he's a good guy he's always treated us well and you know all that kind of stuff and he's he's done so many great things for the program but look at where you know digger phelps did a lot of great things for the program too in his time. And eventually it was time to move on from Digger Phelps and Mike Bray's become the program's all-time winningest coach. And, and maybe it's time to, you know, to start a new chapter with Notre Dame men's basketball. Yeah, it sure seems like that is unfortunately where it's headed because like you said, Mike Bray is a, a great person. He's a, he's a great coach, but you know, being those things doesn't win you games and in a business where you have to win games and that's what you're, judged by you know i just i think it is time to put in serious consideration of moving on from bray yeah all right well that's going to do it for tonight thanks again for your patience everyone for for the <laughs> internet issues that i had here unfortunately was able to get back in and and get things rolling once again jesse hope you're feeling better soon and uh, we'll talk to you what on thursday vince will be in tomorrow with uh, the mailbag show. So we'll have the mailbag show and of course, rapid fire tomorrow as well. So uh, hit the like button on your way out. If you haven't already hit it, subscribe rate and review on your podcast platforms. And we will talk to you tomorrow on Ivy nation sports talk.